I now look to Stephen Erlanger to close the case for the proposition. Still. Thank you, Mr. President. I'm allowed to call you Mr. President, I, I believe. Um, I want to praise all who participated, praise my opposition, particularly praise those members who've stood up on the floor. It's a very brave of you, and you did a very good job. Um, I spent some time here studying Russian at St. Anthony's um, as, a, as, a, as a senior fellow, and I quite like my time here. Um, I discovered a very good fish and chip shop way up the road called Chicken Barbecue, which I think <laughs> Inspector Morse also enjoyed in the Morse novels. But when I was studying Russian, it was a happier time. Um, the system was collapsing. It was quite clear communism was over. But what we have now is something very, very different. I just want to remind you, this has been referenced before, but in May 2016, in the middle of a heated American presidential campaign, a Russian troll factory created a near riot in Houston, the city of Houston, by creating through competing fake Facebook posts an anti-Islam rally at the opening of a library at the Islamic Center. There was a counter-protest, police were called, the mess became an issue for the city council, the Facebook page was called The Heart of Texas, and it had 250,000 likes. In fact, it was actually in the heart of Russia. Now, the Russian involvement was not discovered by the press, but from uh, hundreds of fake accounts, Congress forced Facebook to hand over. Um, since then, we know a great deal more about the way the social media, Facebook, Twitter, Google, blah, 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 have been happily manipulated. Only now are these essentially avaricious commercial companies, and thank you to the member in the blue shirt, beginning to take responsibility, only now, and not merely pretend they are highways and have no interest in controlling whatever scurrilous, racist, anti-Semitic, anti-democratic vehicles roll upon it, and which demean our discourse. Even here, Brexit, we've just discovered, Russian Twitter accounts, more than 156,000 Russian language Twitter accounts posted English language messages about Brexit in the 48 hours before last year's referendum, pushing on division, pushing on division. And we know, despite Putin's denials about a massive Kremlin-ordered effort using WikiLeaks and the GRU and bots galore to damage Hillary Clinton to affect the French and German elections. Now, this is simply an example of the damage social media is doing to our democracies and our sense of what is credible and what is fake. Social media amplifies division and rancor and it does it with algorithms and lots of personal information that we happily hand over. It breeds contempt for the other. It sees different sides see different facts or nonsense purporting to be fact. So like many of the things we celebrate at first, the French Revolution, the Arab Spring, perhaps the Obama presidency, we find out that there are darker sides manipulated by some of the more clever and malign among us. Bots produced one of every five political messages on Twitter in the American presidential campaign. The Rand Corporation calls this a firehood of falsehood, a fire hose of falsehood, sorry. But what does this have to do with journalism? Everything. Journalism cannot function well in a damaged democracy where fake news is spread more widely than real news. Fake news can be amusing and witty, but most people are not actually especially amusing or discerning. Truth is not beauty. Truth is hard work. In a remarkable study, Mr. Smith's BuzzFeed, which itself has, has evolved from clickbait to real journalism, found, as my colleague mentioned, 
that fake election news produced more hits than real election news. And some of the election news that was fake was not just witty and fun, but suggested that Clinton's health was deteriorating, that Clinton had sold weapons to ISIS, that the Pope had endorsed Donald Trump. These are not pranks. These are deeply serious efforts to create havoc with false news and to undermine the mainstream media. The evidence is clear, said Brendan Nyan of Dartmouth College. Bogus stories have incredible reach. Facebook should be fighting misinformation, not amplifying it and not profiting from it in the way it so clearly is. Now, we know the issues. Hack stories, unfounded allegations, unedited, unchecked rumors, deliberate lies, all kinds of nastiness, the siloing of information whereby people read only what they agree with and follow only those who make their case. Cruelty, racism, sexism, a coarsening of the debate, not its broadening, and made viral by social media. In Myanmar, for instance, Facebook is the main source of news for many, and it has deepened the hatred against the Rohingya. Imagine had it been available in Rwanda. This is not a complaint about the internet, which has damaged our business model, but also brought millions of new readers, and it has brought a lot of information to us. But information, as Henry Kissinger once pointed out, is not wisdom. That requires mediation, that requires the media, that requires editors, that requires professionals who are trying to make a judgment as best they can about what is real and what is not. Yes, go ahead. It took the New York Times 10 years to call torture, torture. I, I'm, I'm sorry. It took the New York Times 10 years to call torture, torture. Your, um, your I, I don't know. Well, that's fine. I mean, torture me with it. It's fine. <laughs> um, but there is another disturbing aspect to all this. Regional newspapers are dying and lurching toward clickbait themselves. Even great newspapers were writing junk we never used to write before. And why? Because we're following trends, trends on social media, trends on Google News. Not because we think they are especially newsworthy, but we have whole teams of writers to do this because we are looking for subscribers. Thank you. The Daily Mail, of course, online is famous for its clickbait, but it hurts us too. Just last Sunday, the Washington Post was featuring links to stories up at the top about incest, hijab Barbie, shark attack. We've done stories about a big blob of fat in the London sewers, let alone lots of stories about Donald Trump's strange hair. On Wednesday, on our own home front, we had the hearty Thanksgiving perennial, how to roast a turkey, but also how to deep clean your fridge, and five wellness items you didn't know you needed. I'm not sure I still know. Is this good for readers? Maybe. Is it good for journalism? Maybe not. The pressure to stay alive is forcing us to do and to parrot stories we would not normally consider worth our time. Now, it's not true that social media doesn't help us. We get news from social media. We have broken the Harvey Weinstein sex story. Through the hashtag MeToo, we have found out other information. So this is a balance that we're talking about. But what bothers me is the speed with which we're now producing material. We don't have the fact checking we used to have. We are down to two eyes of editors on a story that's official policy, down from four. The interest is in speed. It's in being competitive. It is to compete with social media. Now, we hope to remain our grip on reality and on our business and on our authority. But it's all becoming that much harder. And the result, I believe, will be bad for our democracies. And it has already undermined good journalism. Thank you very much.